is that we are hearing from the mother and baby homes report. This week I was approached by someone who was directly affected and we've all heard the devastating stories of neglect, abuse and cruelty in a whole host of institutions throughout our land where mothers and babies were treated in a way that we find hard to comprehend or credit. I'm not going to repeat the accounts. You have, I'm sure, all heard them. And anyway, how do you choose which is more worthy to be repeated, which is more horrific? And however many times we read these stories, the outcome will never change. We cannot change the past. But that is not to say we can do nothing. In the case of the Church of Ireland, we can acknowledge our role in what went on. The fact that members of our church, both lay and clerical, supported and facilitated the Bethany home. That some of our clergy served on the board. That the attitudes fostered within our church community contributed to the tragic fate of so many young girls, women and babies. That is something we have to take ownership of. It is not something we can walk away from. We might like to think that it has nothing to do with us. But I wonder if you or I were born 50 years ago, perhaps, might we have protested what was going on? Or would we more likely just have gone with the flow and perhaps even been active participants? I'm not saying that everyone associated with the Bethany home or other homes was cruel or callous. Of course, that was not the case. But there is no doubt that the way women and babies were treated was not right, and in some, indeed many cases, was appallingly cruel and even sadistic. In the case of the Bethany home, there's been a prolonged campaign for the Church of Ireland to admit its links and bear some responsibility for the fate of the residents. And so, when on last Friday, the two archbishops of our church issued an apology for our church's role in the mother and baby homes, I was relieved that we had finally stepped up to the plate. But my heart sank as I read the so-called apology. Yes, it did, on the face of it, acknowledge the suffering of the women and children involved, but not without various qualifications, including the mention that we were complicit, as with the rest of society thereby diluting our role, and an attempt to distance ourselves from the Bethany home, which, it commented, operated under a general Protestant ethos while being independently managed. Why, oh why, did we feel the need to punctuate our so-called apology with excuses and qualifications? Bad enough as this was, worse was to come, in the form of the attached notes to editors. These were considerably longer than the apology, and that should have rung alarm bells straight away. And they effectively negated everything that had gone before in what was a legalistic and heartless disassociation of the Church of Ireland from the Bethany home. This was an opportunity for a generous, and compassionate apology, without qualification or excuse. But what was offered in the name of our church was a cynical exercise in public handwashing. And to be honest, the overall emphasis of the so-called apology came over not as an attempt to reach out to the victims, which it should have been, but rather to protect the institution of the Church of Ireland. To all those who continue to bear the hurt and abuse that my church was complicit in, I am truly sorry that this is the best that we could offer. You deserve so much better. This was bad religion and did not reflect what the church is called to be and can be. With no disrespect to lawyers, this statement seemed to me and many others with whom I have spoken to be rooted in legal language, an attempt to minimise our liability. But even if we didn't own the Bethany home, members of our church, some of them clergy, were involved in one way or another. We may indeed have some liability, and if we do, it may hurt us in our pockets. But I would rather that than that we fail the most vulnerable. 
Some will say that the archbishops as trustees have a legal liability to protect the assets of the church. But I would want to suggest that when the church puts itself before the hurt and the broken and little children, the wounded and the marginalised, that the church has effectively ceased to be church and needs to question what it has become. We are the body of Christ. When one part hurts, we all hurt. We all have a responsibility towards one another. There is no them and us in the church. We do not or should not define ourselves against one another in the manner of the Pharisee and the publican, but rather embrace our unity with one another as creatures of a loving God and his Son who prayed that we would be one. But that wasn't what I heard in this apology. What I heard was, we are sorry this happened, but it wasn't us, it was them. But if we are truly the body of Christ, none of that matters. We bear responsibility for everyone created and made in the image and likeness of God. Each one of us, as Psalm 139 reminds us, is fearfully and wonderfully made. And that includes each of those mothers who had their babies stolen from them and those babies who were wrenched from their mother's arms, as well as those that died in very questionable circumstances. This is a time for repentance, but it is also a time for courage to face up to our calling, to face up to our responsibilities as church. Sometimes like the boy Samuel in our Old Testament lesson or Nathaniel in our gospel, we may not discern that calling immediately. But when we do hear it, we are compelled to follow. For the sake of the memory of all who have died and all those who live with the pain of the past, may we hear that call and respond with love and love alone. Amen. So let us proclaim our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only